You guys can talk though. You can. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Talk to each other. <laughs> Should we be on mute? I guess if I have a fire truck go by, I'll turn it on. <laughs> New Orleans is well, it's all night. How are you sleeping? You got earplugs in? You know, uh, they like they love to use their horn here. I've discovered that for a guy that lives out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that when a coyote will wake you up. This this town's hard to sleep in, but there is a, such a thing as um medicine you take just before you go to bed. <laughs> it helps you sleep. <laughs> It looks like it. liquid medicine. All righty. There we go. We are mirrored over to Facebook. So we'll let Facebook catch up to us uh, as people get notices that uh, we've gone live. And so we'll allow everybody to click on over. Uh, looks like we, uh, with Steve and Martha over in Columbus, uh, above freezing, huh? Well, that's better than last time. I think it was a whiteout uh, last week when you uh, tuned in and uh, sipping on a 18 Jacob Toff. Mary Jane's Cuvée. That is a really delicious bottle of wine for sure. So good for you guys. Uh, as we allow everybody to uh, get on, just say hello to everyone that's uh, tuning in again. Thank you everyone for always tuning into the Paso Wine Hour. Uh, we're going to have a pretty neat show today talking a little bit about farming and agriculture in general, of course, with a little bit of the viticultural uh, twist to it, but uh, we're going to get to that here in, in just a minute. But first, before we do that, I would love the opportunity to introduce the guests today. So we have Molly Scott with Justin Vineyards and Winery, Brent Burchett with San Luis Obispo Farm Bureau, and Doug Filipponi with Santa Margarita Ranch. Uh, Molly, hello. Hi. Hi. You've been on before. Thank you for being on again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Awesome. Uh, Brent with uh, San Luis Obispo Farm Bureau, please say hello to everybody. Good to be with you all. I'm, we got some folks from Ohio. I'm from Kentucky, so you are close by to my family's farm. Glad you're mm -hmm. on. Very cool. And then Doug Filipponi, your first time on the show. Welcome, yeah. Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for having, uh, having me as well as the other guests on tonight. Uh, looking forward to a fun show talking about agriculture, my favorite subject. <laughs> Absolutely. It is. You've been doing it a long time. Before we jump into it, though, today, Molly, we've been having a lot of unusually warm weather. So some of for, for some of you are in the East Coast, Midwest or whatever. Yeah, I know you're going through uh, some some cold weather and the like, but it's unusually warm here. What's that mean to the vineyards right now? What are we looking at? I mean, are, we're not going to have an or we're probably going to have an early bud break is Possibly. Um, yeah, just to kind of give everybody a little frame of reference. So I was looking at the, I mean, it's about 75, 78 right now in Paso Robles, which is a tad toasty for our liking for early February. Um, everyone is making some mad dashes and working on pruning. And it's um, a little bit of a mind game where Sometimes we would start with just some pre-pruning at this point, but um, kind of taking a look and seeing if we're actually getting a lot of sap flow and if we're going to maybe start seeing some green stuff and some fuzzies come out here shortly. And hopefully we can get a nice miracle march and not followed by too much spring frost and we'll be fine. Yeah, hopefully we'll get a little bit more right? water too, right? Yeah, but it's it's a uh, it's it's definitely a little warm. So. Yeah, yeah. We had how are the and that we did have some really cold mornings for what seemed like at least two weeks. I mean, did that? But the, any of those hard freezes that really you know did any any good to to keep us in dormancy or? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's hard to say. I don't. If for instance, I don't. We didn't. They weren't cold enough for for vine kill or vine damage, so to yeah. say. Um, thankfully, or, or truthfully, we'll probably be able to measure that later on in the season or even next year. But um, yes, we'll gladly take you know any more winter chill hours that we can get. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doug, what's happening down in, in the Margarita? Well, uh, like uh, with Molly, you know the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the days. I have spiked up. Uh, one of the things that we uh, have down at Santa Margarita Ranch is uh, probably some of the coolest uh, evenings in the county. 
Now, sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not so good. For right now, we're happy to have those cooler uh, mornings because uh, I've seen these. Uh, these we'll have a week or two in January, February that'll it'll jump up like this, and all of a sudden, uh, the almond trees start blossoming, and it's like, oh God, this is going to be a fun frost protection season. But yeah. I think. Uh, the one thing we have no control over, which is what we worry the most about, is the weather. So, you know, you just got to just uh, throw your hands up in this letter buck. So I think uh, as long as we're positioned well for frost protection, if we do have an early bud break, we'll just have to do an early protection. And uh, hopefully that's not the case. Uh, we, we still need a lot of rain. We got we were blessed with uh, 18 inches or more rain in those last two dumps. So we're... Uh, we're looking for uh, if anybody's listening up there. We're looking for we're looking for at least one more good soaking. So, I think I've been worried about this for so many years. I quit worrying about it. <laughs> you just gotta take what the year gives you. It's it. That's farming, right? And that's actually yes. it's a that's a good segue, honestly, into our topic today, uh, because I think that there is an easy disconnect out there. Uh, between wine and farming when it comes to the greater wine world and when we're, where people are maybe purchasing wine. Uh, ultimately, it is an added value agricultural product, right? But grapes don't just magically appear in a winery to be made uh, into what makes us all happy after a rough day or complements a delicious meal, gives, gives influencers something to take selfies with or hobby types to pontificate over. It's a fruit. It was farmed by a farmer, grown in the ground, nurtured by nature and harvested when ready. Uh, that's a pretty simplistic way of putting it, I know, but universally farming and agriculture are the backbone of our society, right? And wine and wine grapes are, are part of that, as well as they've had a cultural significance dating back to BC. But to bring it full circle uh, into more recent times, agriculture and farming do face some modern day challenges uh, that require a lot of representation and marketing, where we, the Wine Alliance, actually help with that marketing aspect, as well as to some extent advocacy. Uh, but in the county, wine grapes make up about 25%, I believe, of the gross agricultural product grown here. So there's a lot more that meets the eye in San Luis Obispo County. And that's basically where Farm Bureau comes in uh, to help represent, advocate, inspire that farming way of life in our county that's been around for forever, for hundreds of years, right? Uh, and so that's why we, we've, we're talking to Brent today uh, with the San Luis Obispo uh, Farm Bureau. Uh, Brent, and you know, we put that call out all the time to people like, hey, you got a story idea you want to talk to talk about on Paso Wine Hour? Brent responded and said, hey, let's talk about Farm Bureau. And I think that's a fantastic idea. I think uh, I responded in like one. two seconds. I was like, two seconds. I'm like, oh, I got one. I'm getting in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was like, yeah, that's totally makes sense. So Brent, thanks so much for, for being on. I mean, Farm Bureau, right? Um, something that everyone should know, they're celebrating their 99th year as, as, as an organization uh, in our county. Um, Brent, tell us a little bit about Farm Bureau. What, what do you guys do? Sure, so this is, we're about to hit our 100th year. So December 28th, uh, 2022 will be the official anniversary. That's probably gonna be a busy week for folks. We're gonna celebrate a little bit earlier. Uh, probably in September, we have our 100th anniversary special uh, or celebration, I should say. Uh, we're it's so excited because it's people like on this call. It is Doug and Molly. And uh, if you would have told me, you know, two, two, three years ago when I started this job that I would get to be on a, a panel with these two uh, really pioneers of our industry here in San Luis Obispo County and wine grapes has uh, not always been a part of our agriculture production, but today it is a huge part of it. It is a leader. It is what uh, drives tourism. It is tied into our uh, local economy just by itself, let alone all the other agriculture multipliers and the jobs it creates and the processing side with the wineries. But uh, really the job of Farm Bureau is to make sure uh, that these two people can keep doing what they're doing. We want to keep farmers and ranchers in business. We advocate for them at the local level, at the County Board of Supervisors, at the Planning Commission. We'll do uh, all those regulations that you hear about that farmers are often frustrated with, whether that's on the employment side, whether it's on crop protection products, whether it's on land use, uh, water access, really a pretty wide gamut. We represent all of agriculture. So I've got uh, cattle ranchers, I've got avocado growers, I've got wine grape growers, strawberry growers, and it's the diversity of Slow County's agriculture that sets it apart. We're not the number one 
uh, gross production in California, a county that produces most agriculture products, but uh, Slow County is unique and special. When I moved here in 2000, gosh, 19, I wasn't really excited about moving to California. I'm from Kentucky and I heard a lot of stuff about California, uh, but I soon learned this is the best dadgum place to be in California. Just the people are my type of people. They're hardworking, they're uh, grounded. This is a, a really unique um, wine economy and kind of a culture here. And so it's so cool that, um, you know, I do a lot of stuff lobbying and, and speaking up on behalf of our members, but uh, sometimes I have to step back and look as I'm driving you know, out to Oyster Ridge or out through Adelaide and uh, seeing all the cool stuff and think, man, my God, this is, this really is paradise and what a blessing it is to um, support this community. And so Farm Bureau's job is uh, to keep farmers and ranchers in the business of producing food and drink that we depend on. And uh, I, strangely enough, I've had like three radio interviews today and I keep talking about how it's, I just want to pinch myself sometimes to think, because uh, I, I don't think I had drank wine maybe twice in my life before I moved out here, but I'm getting pretty cultured, y'all, and I'm just so feel really neat in my career that I'm here with two uh, really people maybe know this already, but really big deals in our wine industry here, uh, and so special. They're all Farm Bureau members, and the partnership we have with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance is uh, very close, and we work very well on on government affairs issues. And uh, the the difference and the strength of Farm Bureau is that uh, we make vegetable producers aware and care about what's happening in the wine grape industry. We make our cattle ranchers understand what's happening, uh, avocado growers, and it's when we're all together. And I think if there's, there's so few, as Doug and Molly know, there's so few people in the business of farming and ranching. There's so few of us today that produce food for the masses, whereas our, uh, all of our grandparents were full-time farmers. That's what you had to do to live. And our mm -hmm. society's gotten so far removed from that that telling the story of agriculture, telling about what we're doing on environmental sustainability, on our stewardship of the land is, um, we just don't have enough hours in the day to get that message out because there's so few of us. We come together as a farm bureau and that amplifies our message. I saw, I, I read this good quote and, and you made me think about it just now uh, from John F. Kennedy. It says, the farmer is the only man in our economy or woman I should include now. Uh, so I'm changing his quote a little bit. Economy who buys everything at retail, sells everything at wholesale, and pays the freight both ways. Uh, it's, that's so, so true. Uh, Dougie, you've been, you've been doing this a long time, and congratulations, by the way. We, we didn't really talk about it before, but I'm going to bring it up now that you were uh, recognized as a 2021 Agriculturist of the Year uh, by Farm Bureau. Uh, so. Great. I think it's very hard to put with the rest of the honors because I know you have like a wall of things that you've been recognized for. <laughs> you know, I've been farm I, here a while. Very, very humbled by that one. And uh, it was the best part of the whole thing was I got to spend a lot of time with Brent. Uh, he called uh, or sent me an email and said, "Can I get together with you?" And I'm thinking, you know, okay, they probably need an auction or an auction, uh, you know, you know how it is, you think, <laughs> Money. <laughs> sure, Brent, yeah, well, meet me for lunch, so he met me for lunch, and then he, we, he started to tell me about this whole thing, and I, and I was really, uh, I think, taken aback, I, it, was, it was a wonderful award, and uh, uh, I've had a lifetime, and born on a dairy there in Paso Robles, and moved to Atascadero, California, and then, of course, gotten involved in grape growing uh, more than 30 years ago, and winemaking uh, over 16 years ago. So it's been a, a great run, not finished running, by the way, still still doing a little jogging, but uh, it's, been, it's been a great, uh, a great run. And as Brent pointed out, the American farmer feeds uh, with a fraction of the land they used to, to farm uh, twice and three times as many folks and feeding not just our United States, but feeding the world. So the American farmer does so much with, uh, with far less. And the, the struggles and the challenges that we have, if we didn't have Farm Bureau in there uh, keeping an eye out for us, we're out there with our head down and our rear ends in the air, you know, working. And the Farm Bureau has to be the ones to keep an eye on regulation, keep an eye on some of these crazy things that go on that we all realize that we need regulation, but over-regulation uh, is, is just critical to farming. And thank God we've got the Farm Bureau for the last 99 years and hopefully another 99 and more. What challenges, since you've been doing this a while, 
have you seen uh, over the years that uh, being together, because that's the other thing you guys, that, that everybody watching is, is, you know, a common theme that comes out of the Paso Wine Hour is often the camaraderie of our region. And that's great. That's, that's a thing, right? That's a thing that, that's here. However, with Farm Bureau, it's, it becomes a little bit more, it's, it's a little bit more organized of a, I suppose, camaraderie as you become a member. Same with the Wine Alliance. You're a, a member of our organization and you're banding together because in, you know, there is strength in numbers. Doug, has there over the time that you've been farming in San Luis Obispo County, some of those challenges that have existed out there that maybe you can directly kind of think back on when it was great that you were able to band together and whether it be through Farm Bureau or, or not that to, to help overcome some of those challenges? Well, I think it's just a, a continual process, really, Chris. You, you, I can think back to the years when we were worried about uh, you know, water, of course, in the last 20 years, water has been an issue for 30, 40 years. First time I ever met Justin Baldwin, we drilled a well for him out of, up, uh, off Chimney Rock Road. And, and those days back in the 80s, you know, we were, we, there was far less vintners and far less pressure on our water. Uh, but that's been a big subject, you know, regulation in, in more forms than you can imagine uh, have, have come down upon us over the last 30, 40 years as well as increases in prices for labor, immigration issues. Um, I can't tell you, fuel, uh, all the things, all the inputs, as, as John F. said, retail on one end and wholesale on the other. Uh, we are, all of our retail stuff has just gone through the roof. So uh, unfortunately, you're probably gonna find a bottle of wine going up in price. It's either that or uh, it'll be gone because Sustainability is, there's three legs to sustainability. We have the environment, which we're, uh, the farmers are the, are the biggest environmentalists in the world because it's their land that they're preserving for their generations and, and for the future. And the second part is the human factor. And if without the human factor, without employees, without people, there is no farming. And the third thing is you gotta make a profit. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a horrible thing, but you gotta make a profit or else it's not sustainable. So all of those things have been uh, part of the struggle with, with agriculture over the last, uh, the, the years that I've been doing it in the last 40 years. Yeah. Molly, you're, you're as, a, as a, I guess you could say maybe a newer farmer <laughs> in a sense, uh, compared to Doug, because Doug, he's, he's been around for a while. <laughs> I've got a couple of gray hairs of what I have left. <laughs> I mean that with all due respect, Doug, you know. I get it. Hey, you know what? I used to be the youngest kid in the deal, and I, now I've just got to look at the youngest kid in the deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, Molly, you have years of, of experience still, but you've been work, working a little bit through, with Farm Bureau, and talk a little bit about how your interaction and what, how, what Farm Bureau has, has helped uh, from what you've seen in the industry here locally? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think what um, is kind of one of almost the most important foundations of Farm Bureau is I actually was first introduced to Farm Bureau when I was at Cal Poly through their Young Farmers and Ranchers program. So they have um, a very extensive network um, where they try to and Brent helped me out, let's say, advocate, get camaraderie, draw um, young adults together who either maybe are interested in farming or come from a farming family and a background and where they can, um, it's kind of a, it's a networking opportunity in a group to understand um, opportunities, maybe job opportunities. Um, and then of course, what's issues and things that are rising that um, kind of need to be monitored. So I, that's where I actually was first introduced and full disclosure, I haven't made a meeting in years, you know, a couple of kids later and now I'm probably too old to be in the club, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I'm too old, I've aged out as well. You're okay, okay, good, good. <laughs> but no, I think, I think that was, um, it's something really important um, as often we, see generational gaps with farming. And there's obviously not always a succession plan or family interest. Um, I was born and raised in downtown Seattle and did not come from a farming background, uh, but quickly gravitated towards it. And 
I'm honored to be a part of the farming community today and kind of exciting if my sons are interested. Um, but so I think that's, I think it's really important because um, Farm Bureau can continue to support its current members by ensuring their programs and sustainable futures, but we have to get the next generation involved. So I think they do a yeah. great job of that. Yeah. Do we know that there is a, a, a generational gap occurring right now? I mean, we are lucky that we have Cal Poly, which is an ag school, basically. Right. Um, but how are, I mean, Brent, are you seeing anything as far as like a, a, a lack of interest maybe at all from this next generation coming in? You know, in my day job, whenever I'm inundated with what's happening in Sacramento or what kind of things we're dealing with on the regulatory front, I'll go to a Cal Poly uh, Ag Ambassadors meeting or a Young Cattle mm -hmm. meeting, and that's where you get fired back up. That's when you see that uh, look of optimism and they're interested and they're tackling problems that, that are going to be their generation's issue. We've all, everybody inherits things from the previous, their parents and grandparents, but uh, I, I get excited about the future of agriculture. I think there are so few people in farming, there is a, an educational opportunity there to introduce that these are good paying jobs. They're going to be always in demand as long as we do our job, make sure people have uh, the ability to farm and ranch in this country. And I think a lot of people like your background, Molly, just don't know what sort of opportunities are there. And this is not, you know, the old farmer uh, on the tractor out there. You know, we like to be in our tractors, no doubt about it. But <laughs> mostly your all's farming is you're, you're managing. You're managing people. You're trying to yeah. coordinate uh, such a big operation because in, in modern agriculture, it just requires so many inputs. We're being asked to do, as Doug said, so uh, produce so much with so little and all the restraints on our environment, which are good things we take pride in. But uh, these kids get excited about that. And they're excited about, what agriculture will look like in the future. Uh, but in general, on the flip side, I worry that, you know, we've gotten where we don't think we need to grow food in this country, that we just let others take care of that. Uh, and that's what, that's what scares the heck out of me. So Cal Poly, I wish every school had as much enthusiasm for agriculture as Cal Poly does. And it yeah. An outsized presence across the state. Uh, but young farmers and ranchers role is to make sure they can take that college education, connect it with someone like Molly and Doug and know what opportunities are actually out there and try to keep them in this region. It's so expensive to live here in St. Mm -hmm. Louis Obispo County. So I think that's a challenge, but they're going to be ambassadors for agriculture wherever they go. It was, it was great. I actually just the other day met with um, a young woman and she's graduating in March from Cal Poly and she's a brave major. So um, bioresource ag engineering, and she is one of six females in the graduating class and um, I really commended her because she was interested in studying wine and viticulture and pursuing that degree but she had a passion for sustainable irrigation management thank god <laughs> because I said the doors are gonna fly open for you um, considering her background and studying um, irrigation management and sustainable farming and it's so much greatly applicable to obviously the wine industry and staying here local on the central coast. But like Brent said, you know, we have a lot of other crops to focus on as well. So um, there was kind of hope in seeing a, a young female coming out of the Bray major. So yeah, Cal Poly's doing a great job. Yeah, I, I think I remember a young female a while ago that introduced me to a taste of Washington. Who was that? <laughs> <laughs> We, she was, uh, she was, well, you tell the story, Molly, because it was, <sighs> yeah, that was a long time part. ago. Yeah, I'm a Cal Poly alum, and um, I was president of the Vines to Wines Club, and I roped in Doug to buying a, an auction item package for a trip up to Washington, so. <laughs> it was fabulous, I, and, and we, uh, <laughs> Kathy and I, we, it was really our first downtown experience. We just walked everywhere, really? went to all the exhibits went through the market it was it was incredible and i owe that to you that was but it opens your eyes but being a cal poly alumni myself and uh and knowing uh cal poly is all about learn by doing and that we we get interns from cal poly to come out in the winery and out in the vineyard and i think everyone in uh in our line of work needs to get more of these young people out so they can really get their hands on out there in the vineyard pruning and man and watching what it takes to make a bottle of wine. I tell you, people uh, would pre really appreciate that glass of wine a little more if they knew all the steps that it took to make it and how mm -hmm. many people 
Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Brent, when it comes to agriculture, though, let's talk about other ag in, in the county. I mean, where does where does wine rank? Because I think I saw in that crop report that I was referencing before that, it, you know, wine grapes are, are only 25 percent. And really, I guess it's about 37 percent or so is, is strawberries. I mean, is strawberries, strawberries are the bigger thing in our county. Is that right? They, they flip flop every the last couple of years. They have rotated number one, number two. And most people probably know this already, but just to make sure that this is in terms of value. So the gross value of production, this wouldn't mean that the most acreage in San Luis Obispo County is strawberries, but if you had a total sales of those, wine, grapes, and strawberries are pretty close to each other, but they usually flip flop for number one. And that's not necessarily reflective of, of you know, strawberries did uh, had a better yield that year. It's often the market. So the, I believe 2019, when I first moved here was uh, wine grapes that were number one, and that was the first year we were a billion dollars in gross agriculture sales for this county. And I think last year, you maybe mentioned this, Chris, 750, a little bit higher was gross, and that was largely because of a depressed wine grape market. So mm-hmm. one of the positives of this county is we're diversified. We've got not all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. We are able to have a, maybe a down year in avocados and an up year in cattle. I don't know if there's ever an up year in cattle, Doug. I'll take <laughs> things like that when yeah. bad all the time, but this county, whenever COVID hit, you know, if you were stuck in, uh, you know, Nebraska and it was snow in January, where was your food coming from? Well, this community is provides food for this entire country. You go to Tommy Ketta's place in, in Pismo, just a little bit south of us here, and, you know, they're shipping produce that's going to Stephen and Martha in Columbus, Ohio, and at their grocery store mm-hmm. shelves. And I, that's so cool to me. And I thank you all that the longer you live here, you start to take that for granted. And you go to a farmer's market and my God, look, there's, you know, 80 different commodities that you're looking at that were grown right here that you could grow. I can't grow anything. I kill everything in my house and my garden, but uh, we've got- You're the head of Farm Bureau. Wait, (laughs) you don't have black thumb? (laughs) Brent, it's just better if you talk. You don't need to farm. That's right. That's right. I just play a farmer. My family is, uh, my dad, he farms full time and we're a traditional Midwest corn, soybean, wheat, and raised tobacco. So I can talk about tobacco and uh, uh, bourbon's big in Kentucky. So I'm trying to learn the, the wine lingo. And I've been Googling like how to pronounce varieties. So I don't sound too stupid when I'm talking to Molly and Doug. And the There's no wrong answer. You can call right. it Merlot if you want. We'll sell it. We pronounce it wrong too. <laughs> No, but we're I, not that fussy. We will sell it to you no matter what you call it. We're at it. I've heard people say this before, and I have, as I, you know, California Farm Bureau, we got county farm bureaus all across the state, but this region is wine culture is just cool. I, I don't know if it's like a cowboy culture, but it is open and welcome, and it makes it a great place to visit for novices like myself, and there's just not this um, kind of like stigma of wine. You got to be an insider to get in, and that's not the case here. Pass a wine. But, it's cool. Everybody's welcome, and I let me tell you a little story. It's it's the it's the most uh, incredibly friendly, competitive business there is. Uh, when we first started growing thirty years ago, it, I, we absolutely knew nothing. Okay, it was just like when I started in the well business, knew nothing. So you know, it would, wasn't strange to me to start something different. But I could call Herman Schwartz, or I could call uh, uh, oh golly, Hank. Ag- be, and those guys would come over and say, Doug, you know, this work better if you do this or you do that. And they were helping every step of the way. And if you need, uh, if you need anything, call me. If you need gondolas, I'll deli- I'll bring them down to you. No, no, I'll come out and get them. No, you know, but that's the kind of attitude Pass Robles is all about. And it's, it, and it's still permeable today. I can go to any winery and tell them I'm having a problem trying to figure this out or the other out. And they're not going to just look at me like, good luck, you know, they're going to try to help you in any way. And it's really a unique thing to this, this world, I think, in the wine world, in the grape world. It's not like any other business there is that I know of that I've been in. You know, it's rare that you have a competitor try to help you. And in this business, that's the way it is. Yeah, that's it's a great thing for Paso as well. I mean, like I said before, we often talk about the camaraderie of this region, but it really is there and, and it's great Brent that you recognize that uh, here being a, a, a recent in the last uh, three years I guess it is a transplant to 
the central coast and and to this area that uh, you're kind of you're seeing that because I think that is definitely one of those things that sets us apart as a wine region. So it is unique to us. Um, can't say that, that that doesn't exist in other regions too. To some extent, we're not going to lay ownership. Of, <laughs> we're cool. Uh, yeah. We're totally. <laughs> 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 but but no, very, very, very true. Uh, Brent, what are some of the challenges, maybe not for wine that exists out there, but for farming in our in our community that maybe we don't see or know about that uh, are things to to talk about, to things that we should really be aware of? Uh, that bottle of wine that we all enjoy cannot get to you without farm workers. And they are predominantly uh, coming from other countries, from Mexico, from Latin America. And there has been a, we, we raised tobacco growing up. And so we, we brought in guest workers from Mexico and I, they were kind of like family to us. I know every situation is different, but that was something that I thought was kind of standard. And I, I come out to, to California and I see how extensive we are relying, our entire food system is on farm workers. And we talk about food prices and what should wages be and all these issues. But at the end of the day, this country will stop if we do not have farm workers. And my colleagues at Kentucky Farm Bureau and uh, kind of this, I guess, the eastern part of the U.S., not to get too political, I don't think they get it on immigration. I don't think they really appreciate that uh, because much of U.S. agriculture is mechanized and they're using my dad farms, uh, you know, 11, 1,200 acres with a combine and one hired hand and one guy, you know, local at work. Um, here, our produce and our wine grapes take individual, that hand touch, and are we going to move to mechanization long term? Absolutely. But uh, in the immediate short term, we've seen this um, with COVID, and I've seen how the great lengths that farm employers and labor contractors go, and a lot of them were form former farm workers. A lot of them, this is their family, and it's so important for the public to realize that uh, in agriculture, everything starts uh, with our farm workers. If we don't keep them healthy and uh, recognize the housing challenges we have in Slocane, we, a lot of our farm workers don't live here. And so in California, the cost of living, that's impacting our ability to harvest crops, which doesn't seem necessarily intuitive. Uh, I think if we could just appreciate how vital farm workers are to our community and that you know, keeps going up the line, if there wasn't ag employers, there would be no need for farm labor. They wouldn't be able to send money back uh, to their families. And that's always amazing to me, that hard work that they're able to send money back. And I just think how expensive it is to live in California. That's been the biggest you know, shock to me when I moved out here, what cost of rent, cost of gas and everything here. but um, I think the, the average American farmer or politician just doesn't really understand how vital this is to our national security. We, we don't have anything without workers. Uh, I could rattle on about um, crop protection products and the way we do sustainability with water and how much we're doing so much more with less. But I think too often when you're not in an industry, you're uh, kind of susceptible to uh, experts that have never farmed in their life, or maybe they farmed a little bit and they don't really appreciate uh, if anybody thinks they, they got farm policy figured out, I, I encourage you to use your farm policy to try to feed yourself and your family. Go out and do that. And hats off to you if you can, but uh, we, we need a lot of diversified agriculture operations. We need to recognize that uh, farmers in the United States are doing some of the most incredible work. Our farm technology is, is often stolen by other countries. Our seed technology, we've got South County uh, greenhouse growers that produce all the you know, celery starter plugs that start that are planted across the country. We've got uh, flowers mm -hmm. that you buy at Lowe's and Home Depot that are grown in Los Osos and Napomo. And I think the interconnectedness of this county's agriculture is that uh, people are trying to find a make a, a way to make a living, and that is increasingly becoming so hard. So when you hear a regulation or a uh, some kind of thing that sounds positive, and you know, believe it or not, not farmers drink the same water that you that the public does. We live out of these ranches. Uh, environmental stewardship is our legacy. And I think too often you get this big farmer, small farmer mentality a discussion that uh, is, is such a joke in my mind. And I, I want people to always shop local. I want you to appreciate your farmer's market, uh, but realize we have a big food system. We have a lot of needs. We have a lot of people with different income levels and uh, having food affordability is important, especially with well, all the disruption in our economy right now. But um, you could tell I get passionate about agriculture. Just That's to great. I was going to say, you know, you need. We to got a good guy in your position. Oh, sorry, Doug. Go ahead. I say, Brent, you need to open up a little bit. You, you know, that shyness bug in you is just not working. <laughs> Bottom line is, 
you know, we need Farm Bureau to educate people because news media doesn't want to tell you that how well American farmers are doing and how little inputs we're using to produce a ton of tons and tons of food and and where we've come in the last hundred years in farming and all these things that Brent's telling you, no one it, no one wants to put that out on the nightly news. They'd rather talk about something that's, uh, you know, not as as as. Uh, welcoming a story to farmers. Bottom line is farming in this country uh, without good uh, uh, mechanization, without good inputs uh, would, would not, would we be back a hundred years ago with mules pulling, pulling plows. It's, it's been, uh, I was just here in, uh, in New Orleans with Brian Talley, who's a local farmer there in the South. He's also has Talley uh, vineyards in their winery. And we were they a had a great CSA program too with their their tally. Yes, I'm yes they one do. of them. Yeah, their tally boxes. Tally boxes, and we were talking about that. You can't imagine how many porch pirates get away with those tally boxes. If you can imagine, I mean, they put them out and then they're gone. Bottom line, we were attending this annual conference here, and uh, there's so much information about about agriculture and farmers and how much good they're doing and how much friendlier we are to the environment than we were 50 years ago, even 100 years ago. And that's just not getting to the American people. And that's where Farm Bureau really comes in to tell that story. Absolutely. You know, it's funny that I, I, I had another quote. I love quotes and I use yes. this show all the time. But I had another one from, from Dwight Eisenhower. You know, farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from the cornfield. And I think that's very apropos to what you guys have been saying now. You know, we are going through a redistricting here in Paso. And so now we're going to be having a different congressman uh, that will be uh, representing our area. And he's been doing his due diligence himself and, and one of his assistants uh, to come down and learn uh, our area. And I think maybe some of you, even on this show, have met with either Jimmy or, or, or um, I forgot, Bruce, was that his name? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, they've been doing their part, though, to try to get down here and learn our area. And I know that that immigration is definitely one of the, the hot topics that I've heard from a lot of the meeting we've helped to facilitate uh, and trying to ensure that we do have a workforce here that will continue, uh, not only in the great in, in the in the uh, viticultural side of things, but also in row crop. So that's uh it's 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 definitely a hot topic uh, right now, Molly. It looked like you were just about to say something. Sorry, did I interrupt you? No. No. Okay. Good. All right. Excellent. You guys. Sorry. <laughs> this is the Paso Wine Hour, <laughs> so we're getting right into some really good meaty stuff. But I still want to know, and I want to start with Brent. Brent, what are you? You know, you're 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 into wine now, and what are you drinking today? Oh, well, so my uh, president of my farm bureau, Hillary Graves, is uh, she calls herself a leaf grower, but she's a pretty extraordinary lady. And, uh, she works with a booker. So I've got the VIP. I got a ripper. I've got a 2019 and it is juicy and very good. Awesome. And Hillary, I think she's been on our our Paso Wine Hour before. I'm yeah, that she has. And she's a great guest and a great advocate uh, for uh, all, all things grown and, and, um, and uh, harvested in uh, the Paso Wine region, but also in our county and just a wealth of knowledge as well. So good on you. Molly, what are you sipping on? Um, I am actually sipping on a Syrah sample. Um, truth be known, we actually just completed our inventory tasting today, um, which is very fun and the hardest part of our job, right? Um, so yeah, I actually really fell in love with one of the wines. So it's actually, it's a 2021 um, Syrah. I know it's tasting quite nice. It's obviously young and bright and zippy and big tannins, but um, I grabbed a little extra pour from the lab, so. <laughs> Thus, not not a bottle or a label, so. No, yeah, so it's actually, so, yeah, it's very, I like that, you're saving the company, <laughs> it's, but, No, it, it's very exciting, um, so um, while we specialize, obviously, in Bordeaux blends, we have some beautiful Syrahs and Rhone programs that we make as well, and 
Um, this Syrah is from one of our West Side Estate vineyards, and we'll see which program it makes into. So, yeah, nice. Yeah, it's fun. Very cool. Doug, you're uh, you're two hours ahead of us. Maybe you're yeah. two glasses ahead of us. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's <got> see. <laughs> this bottle of Ancient Peaks Cabernet was full nice. when I started, and it is now below the label. So let's get another little <laughs> pour out of there. 2019 Cabernet. It's uh, it's very tasty. Nice tannin structure and all the other wine stuff you say about it. Nice, beautiful <laughs> nose. Drinking. I love it, but it drinks very well. Thank you for asking. Awesome. So Brent, I had a quick question for you. So it's it's pretty exciting and new for um, um, the Farm Bureau president to be a representative of the wine industry, right? Hasn't the board just recently had kind of more representation from the wine business? We the have, and uh, Hillary... Hillary took office my very first year. So I've been just super lucky to have someone that is a real dirt under their fingernails farmer that can also yeah. you know, do that in the morning. In the afternoon, I've got her going to two boring meetings to talk about agriculture. And uh, she's got a family and just a super woman. And yeah. she's also like a super bodybuilder. She does the CrossFit stuff. And you know, everybody knows she's, she's pretty awesome, but she's been working for Booker for the last year or two. But yeah. It, We've historically had mostly men. Agriculture has been a male uh, dominated world historically. And Slow County has been fortunate. Our last two presidents have been uh, female. We've had Anna Negranti yeah. before, the family has cattle, and a lot of people know the Negranti family. But um, it, in my opinion, we, we're trying to get better at being aware of what's happening in our vineyard industry because it's easy to kind of get stuck in your bubble of, you know, we're all cattle guys, we're all vegetable mm -hmm. guys. But uh, today, with all of our challenges, we cannot afford to be divided we've got to be together as an industry and yeah our farm bureau is um i think we're about evenly split between paso and slow as our two biggest membership bases but uh, i've got three or four full-time vineyard wine folks i got uh, the great steve carter from j lore i got matt merrill with mesa vineyard management uh, i got hillary and i'm sure i'm leaving out somebody i'm gonna get in trouble later uh, but you're That's right great, very fortunate that we're doing it patricia wilmore and i work very well she works for the wine country alliance and 99% of the time, all farmers are, are pretty much in alignment on the same issues. What we get focused on is that 1% that we don't. We love to split off in little camps and do stuff, and uh, the stakes are just too high. So I think if yeah. there's anybody listening from, you know, the Paso wine industry that's not a member, maybe doesn't know what Farm Bureau is, uh, check out slowfarmbureau.org and get involved, and we'd love to have you in whatever role you'd like to be in. Awesome. Yeah, please, please give a shout out to Molly, by the way, because Molly uh, is the chair of our organization and of our board of directors. And so I uh, just, you know, pointing that one out. And so thank you. For, no, it's uh, an honor. Your, it's very fun. time on the board. Yeah, of course. Doug, you were going to say something. Oh, I just said, you know, please, if you're out there listening and you're not a Farm Bureau member, even if you've just got, uh, you know, a small piece of land and you've got a few cows or you've got a horse or two and you just want to join and be an associate member. Uh, if you want to be a sponsor, be a sponsor of Farm Bureau. Farm Bureau is, does more for agriculture in this country than anyone else. And I'm, I'm a, we've been members for, I hate to say this, but over 40 years. Yeah. And, and never regretted an, uh, not one moment of the time. Awesome. And we're so fortunate to have Brent in, in this county. I hope you don't go back to Kentucky. You know, they grow a lot of tobacco down there. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go back to something uh, that you said, Brent, about small versus large and all of that. And, and one thing that I, I didn't get to say back uh, when we were discussing it then was, is that whether you're a large production brand here in Paso or a smaller production brand, you know, you're still part of this big economic engine that exists here that employs local people. So by and large, basically, I think it's somewhere around 11,000 uh, people that are employed in our, in, just in the viticultural industry, full-time equivalent um, is, is employed by whether large or small. I mean, it's us, it's all of these people and more uh, that are employed in this industry and that shop local, work local, live local, all that kind of stuff. And so while we then bring in even more 
though for farm labor and the like, these are these are the folks that are here day in day out um, and that are, are are basically supported by this very economy. And when you think about it, Chris, you know when you think of all the ancillary businesses that are attached, all the 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 guys we buy our trucks from, our tractors from, all of our supplies, all of our fuel, all those things that we support. Uh, in in agriculture, it's in a, it 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 blows that number just in an exponential way. Yeah, it's two and a half billion dollars is what Doug was saying. That's if you have all the economic multipliers of all of our commodities, uh, the jobs, the payroll, te- you know, all that that's fertilizer input, uh, over thirteen thousand jobs and two and a half billion dollars, and that's uh, that's a leading industry in, in Slow County. And uh, it's, it's also what makes it special. You know, it's great to have an awesome economy. I guess you could be in a very urban area. We have a big city a little few hours south of us. It's a great place, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to live there. This agriculture is what makes this community so special to see and look at. And uh, to your question of small farmer, large farmer, there's actually a California Department of Ag, State, State Board of Agriculture board meeting last week and trying to define what's a small farmer, a medium farmer, a large farmer. And there's couple different indices for that, but you can't think of acreage. You can't think of uh, whether you're incorporated or not. Uh, I've never met a person that can really explain to me what makes me a a big farmer. Is it when I have, you know, 50 cows, I got 51, now I'm big. Is it that scale of production? Is it that I partner with my my brother-in-law to run uh, cattle or try to save expenses? Or is it, you know, partnering with others to have a, a bigger vineyard production? It's just it's not helpful. And it's when this conversation, everybody, you should buy what brands you like. You should support whatever local people you like. Uh, and I think you'll find that when you meet farmers that somebody would say, well, that's a, that's a big company or a big farmer. You get to know them and get to know the challenges they face and see that uh, this is, it's an American success story. A lot of times and I get excited about um, the ability for farms to continue. And a lot of times that's, they have to consolidate. We see this from regulatory pressure and uh, it's not unique to agriculture. It's, it's get big or get out, but we do have some cool opportunities in agriculture where uh, they do have a local market that's really supportive of their niche and they can do just fine and give us that more diversity of our production here that, that we value. We've got, you know, I've got members that have two acres and I've got members that have 20,000 acres and they're running cattle on the bigger and maybe strawberries on the smaller, but um, they're all producing things that we need to live. And I, I get frustrated when I hear non-farming people tell me about big agriculture or organic versus conventional. And there's no doubt about it. We need pressure to make sure that we're doing the best we can to innovate, to rise to the challenges. We know uh, farming is going to look different a hundred years from now than it did a hundred years ago, as Doug was talking about earlier. And I I see the exciting opportunity to meet these challenges, but we got to make sure that farmers and ranchers can stay in business in this country. And that's what I worry about. We work it every day at Farm Bureau to make sure we can. Yeah, absolutely. That's really, really well said. Thank you, Brent. <laughs> We're so fortunate to have you. Yeah, absolutely. Brent, where, how did you find San Luis Obispo County and, and what, what brought you here? I couldn't even pronounce San Luis Obispo County before I got here. <laughs> I never heard of you all. And uh, so my wife, now wife, uh, it's a love story. I, who I do crazy things for love. So I, uh, my wife, Kaya Twistman, is from, from Slope, probably know Twistman family, but uh, she had a, went to college at UC Davis, then she worked overseas for an agriculture company, and then she came back to the U.S. for kind of her first uh, big girl job at a, at a school, and she wound up at the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association just randomly from a LinkedIn post, and uh, she had been living in Europe. She had a nose ring at the time. I'm amazed that the Cattlemen's in Kentucky, that's, we're not a very progressive state in some respects, but uh, they <laughs> took a chance. Kai's awesome. She's got a great personality and really good at her job. And so she went to work for the Kentucky Cattlemen's Association doing like uh, beef, it's what's for dinner, those promotions, working with ranchers. We call them cattle farmers in Kentucky. That's a nuance. But anyway, uh, I was working for the uh, Kentucky Soybean Association at the time when I met her. So uh, we were on a livestock coalition board together and uh, met at the state fair. If you're looking for a good partner, go to the fair, you'll meet somebody good. And I think both her brothers met their wives and her parents met their, anyway. So <laughs> she lived, we lived in Kentucky. It's where we started dating and uh, she missed this place. And I can see why when I get out of here and her family has a, been here for six or seven generations uh, in the Creasa Plains area, Slow County. And so we were in, I was actually working for the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and in Kentucky, we elect our agriculture commissioner like a governor, secretary of state. And 
it was a re-election year. And when you're a political appointee, you're expected to go out and campaign and do all the speak-ins and stuff that I gets pretty old. And so I thought, we'll just slide out for a while, try out California. And uh, they recruited Kaya for the job, of course, because she's more really well-spoken and she knows the area. I wouldn't know uh, avocado if it knocked me in the head, you know, before I got out of here. And uh, so before we <laughs> so applied for the job at the Slow County Farm Bureau, and uh, I guess they were just like, well, he's so different. Let's give him a go here. And uh, they haven't fired me yet. And this year we got uh, County Farm Bureau of the Year last year. So I'm pretty proud. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Boy. yeah, somehow. <laughs> uh, but no, that's how I got out here. And uh, really thankful for all the people on this call, but also many of our members if you know, showed me what the, when I, when I drive around with people giving a tour, they'll say, well, what's that? And I'll be like, oh, I don't know. Is that, is that broccoli? Is that cauliflower? I to check. <laughs> I'm supposed to know this <laughs> right. stuff. But I know farmers. I know agriculture in general. I mean, I know the commodity, but uh, we'll get you a cheat sheet. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> they need to. You know what we need to do? We need to put signs in. Then this is what's being grown here. They used to, to do that. That was used to be a big thing, and we need to bring that back because the consumer doesn't know what that is. Yeah. I know in the Midwest they put uh, like whatever brand of seed. It may be a. Uh, you know, this brand. And so the, the public sees those signs and they think that that company owns that field. It's like, no, they're advertising their seed to other farmers. And anyway, a lot of misconception about agriculture. You know, I think, of course, there's only two. I mean, there's either beans or there's corn. So like <laughs> much in the Midwest. Well, one thing is that you said, we need to get kids back in the farm from, from schools and these field trips used to do with little kids, take them out the yeah. farm, show them what a farm really is. We need to get our school boards back to doing that because most kids have no idea where a gallon of milk comes from. It just comes from the store or, or, or their, where, where any of their greens or, or reds come from. They have no clue. So, you know, I think education, Farm Bureau is number one in that. And the schools need to get these kids back out to the farm just to see where their food comes from. I think it's critical. I mean, yeah, my boys are now a victim of the Target drive up. So <laughs> you guys probably don't even know what that is. Well, is that where you just pick up a bag and then you drive off? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I took a shot at it. So okay. good job, Doug. Your wives are probably getting their pickups right now. It's all good. <laughs> oh, no. She's got to touch every tomato. She's got to you know, <laughs> smell every cantaloupe. Not going to happen. Uh, Which I appreciate because I'm the one that's a consumer, right? <laughs> awesome. Well, you guys, can you believe it's actually almost been an hour already? No. Yeah. Yeah, it has. Hey, I was um, just getting into my next sip. <laughs> Oh, I should shout out, Molly, thank you so much. I'm yeah. drinking the, news, uh, the uh, 2020 Sauvignon Blanc from Justin. And so I went over to the tasting room and, and picked this up today, and it's delicious. Nice. I know my colleagues in the uh, other office here on the other side of my door are enjoying the second bottle. See, what they decided to do is open the second bottle. Great. Well, we call it Friday. Today's Friday, right? It's Thursday. Friday, yeah. It's Friday. So that's all right, yeah. you know. And <laughs> just just check to make sure it wasn't screw capped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a, thank that's you so much, you guys. You guys out there, you don't know about that, but. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show today, uh, Brent. Great idea, and thank you for 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 your input of of uh, getting this show uh, under or out there. So that was fantastic. Thanks for reaching out, uh, Doug. Of course, thank you for uh, taking a little time out of your time in New Orleans. I know you were there partially for work and having a little bit of fun, but we appreciate you being on. And Molly, of course, thank you again for uh, coming on again. Uh, on My pleasure. I now I really appreciate and Christopher it. I need to ask you to have him yeah. back at least every three or four months to educate the public because he yes. is I, I love this guy he, he he really lets people know what agriculture does here in our county and in the United States I appreciate it agreed agreed Brent might have to have a reoccurring spot on this show because you're also quite entertaining and thank you for that 
<laughs> we'll change it to the Paso Farm Hour. There we go. <laughs> Brent, when you first moved here, how did you pronounce Paso? Uh, Paso Robles? No. <laughs> I'm working on it. Kai and I yeah. actually all the names. Oh, good. Yeah, we got it now. Hey, Had Christopher, thank you. Thank you so much for having the show. I mean, yeah. without you, you wouldn't have all these followers and all these folks all over. And I've been watching the chat, and it's great to get people in DC and all other places excited about Paso. And thanks so much for doing that. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate you saying so. Hey, next week on the Paso Wine Hour, we are going to be talking about Blend Fest. Uh, Blend Fest is an, an event that we do over on the coast over in Cambria and San Simeon. It's a partnership that we do with some of those uh, visitor marketing organizations over there as a kind of an off season thing that is super fun. We talk about blends, blended wines, this and that. I host a, a seminar uh, over there at the Cavalier, uh, maybe even get a surf in in the morning. Anyway, uh, but we'll be talking about Blendfest. So please tune in next week. We also have a new podcast out there uh, ready and available for you to listen to on where wine takes you look at that go to pasowine.com for all the latest haps again molly brent doug thank you very much cheers you guys have a great evening cheers, cheers. appreciate you being on and we'll see you thanks next so much for having hour. oh wait you gotta sip <laughs> can't it. cheers and then not sip thanks everyone we'll see ya thanks take care bye